Ms. Ligalisa here, aka Attorney Sheila. I think I'm just going to jump right into looking at this particular website in regards to the hair relaxer lawsuit. If you have not had a chance to catch my previous video about this, please go back and take a look at that. It gives a breakdown over how we got to the space that we're in now, where I'm talking a little bit more about this. Now, of course, you see I have the lots now and whatever this is going on on the top of my head. And I've had this for a little while and I've been natural for a while. But for a very long time period in my life, I relaxed my hair. I relaxed my hair for a very long time. And I can tell you, I have had some of these very issues that this lawsuit is out there talking about uterine fibroids, uterine cancer, endometriosis, hysterectomies, myomectomies. We can go down the list. There has been a scientific study that has shown that there appears to be an increase in some of these things that I just mentioned because of chemicals that were used in some of these relaxers. And there are certain relaxers that are, that are a part of this litigation. But I'm going to start here on aboutlawsuits.com. Why? Because I have looked at so many of these pages and I'm an attorney. I feel uh, I feel even more I feel even more connected to talking about this particular lawsuit because I am a black woman who has used hair relaxers and I'm an attorney. So I feel like I'm I'm touched by this in some sort of way. This this really catches my eye because of that picture. That picture says it all. Now, most of us know that typically that's not a picture of a retouch. That's usually what you see that is going on with a complete relaxer on virgin hair. You're putting the relaxer on all of the hair because all of the hair has never been relaxed before. Now, there are some stylists who, even though, you know, your previous hair may have been relaxed, sometimes they would pull it through. Like they would pull the new relaxer through even hair that had already been relaxed. That really destroys your hair. That kind of double processing can really weaken your hair. So most people know not to do that. Most people did not do that. And so what you would do instead, once you had the virgin hair process the first time, you would just do the retouch. You would just do the new growth. And so this is why, and I, I know for a lot of people watching this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm not trying to teach you anything here. You know this too, but it's just that this stuck out in my, it, it just stuck out with me when I saw this picture, because I'm remembering all those times that I use dark and lovely <laughs> to do my retouches. And as you see, I have not touched a perm in years and I don't plan to ever again. So the FDA, the FDA is looking at, you know, banning some of these chemicals that we have in some of our cosmetic products. But let me pop over here to the actual website so that I can talk a little bit more about what's going on. And as I said, this one really caught my eye. And you can see here, what is the hair relaxer, law, relaxer lawsuit about? Toxic chemicals in hair relaxers and perm kits may cause cancer and other injuries. According to recent studies, one report found that regular users faced a three times greater risk of uterine cancer. Women throughout the U.S. are now pursuing hair relaxer lawsuit payouts against the manufacturers of Dark and Lovely, Just For Me, and other popular products, which fail to warn about the risk. So this is a website that you can go to and get more information about this. I'm not promoting this particular website. Like I said, this one stuck out to me because of the picture. And I think it does a decent job of sharing some of the information. There are tons of websites out there. So definitely uh, do your own research on this issue. There's a piece here that talks about the different products. So if you are not yet familiar with the products, that are in this lawsuit and this lawsuit there are a lot of lawsuits out there but now there's sort of this multi-district lawsuit that's in illinois and actually there is a short form complaint that you can fill out and submit yourself so that you can become a part of the lawsuit and i'm going to share that in another video i don't want to bombard you with a whole bunch in this one dark and lovely just for me optimum care african prize soft and beautiful motions tcb naturals rs olive oil dream kids and other hair perm relaxers. 
And then it says, what injuries qualify? Well, I pretty much <laughs> listed those before we even got started. Now, a lot of these sites that you go to will have this find out if you're eligible and they will have a chat box and they will ask you things, you know, like, when did you first start using a relaxer? When did you stop? If you stopped, what kind of medical issues have you had? How long did you use a relaxer? All of those kinds of things. They will ask you that and then they'll determine, hey, whether or not they're interested in you or not, you know. The thing about it is, um, you know, they're picking and choosing. A lot of them are, and I just, I went through a few just to sort of check them out. And they were like, oh, um, you don't fit our criteria. And I think a lot of them are looking for a certain time frame, to be honest, because um, what was out there initially didn't go as far back as when I was using mine. But here's the other thing. Um, yeah, you could, like I said, you can go to this and read a whole lot more about it. And then they have their things, their information boxes that you can fill out here. And it's like this on just about just about every website that you go to will have a lot of the same information. This one also did a really good job of giving you updates. This is why I wanted to talk specifically about this one. So you can actually scroll to the bottom and, and see like this history and then go up to where we are now. And so this is why I'm sharing this particular website with you because I thought it did a decent job of sort of putting it all together in a way that you can understand and sort of follow what's going on. So the one that they have most recently here is this October 23rd, I'm sorry, this October 2023 update. And so it's now November. So you can see what I mean by them staying on top of things and bringing you the latest news. Um, it says, according to an updated docket report, there are now at least 5,996 hair relaxer cancer and injury claims filed in the federal hair relaxer MDL, and that's the multi-district lawsuit. A number of claims filed has, the number has substantially increased in recent months with the JPML previously reporting 250 active cases back in July. Look at that. From July 2023, they had 250 active cases and now they have 5,996. Now, 5,996 claims that they're saying have been filed. That is a huge increase. I'm going to now go down, and I said earlier, the FDA is looking at banning this. It says, has issued a proposed hair relaxer chemical ban, which would prohibit the use of formaldehyde and chemicals that release formaldehyde. That's the other thing, such as methylene glycol. So you might go to a product, pick it up and say, oh, it doesn't have formaldehyde in it. But the thing about it is methylene glycol, my understanding is once it um, has contact with the air, then it transforms into the substance that's um, formaldehyde like, or, or yeah, okay, I'm not going to try to do that. I am not that kind of scientist. I want to scroll down now and talk about, um, like I said, you can go to this website or plenty of others because this one I think has a lot of information on it. Um, they have examples of relaxer lawsuits, but I want to go down to what these comments say. And part of the reason I want to actually go to these comments is because it is one thing to read a lawsuit that talks about, hey, uh, you know, there was misrepresentation on the part of the manufacturer because the manufacturer knew, you know, after a while, the manufacturer knew that these chemicals were in their products and that they were dangerous. Okay, so they already knew the chemicals were in the products, but at some point in time, they knew they were dangerous, and yet they were still sort of promoting these products as hey, look, you can be, you know, gorgeous and beautiful and have great hair and take care of yourself. You know, they're selling you something when they failed to warn you that what they were selling you was defective and had a problem with it. And so, you know, let's hear it. So it's one thing to hear that type of information, all of that in the litigation when I'm reading some of this. It's entirely different to hear from black women, because these are black women's products mostly that we're talking about, to hear from black women about the experiences that they had. Like that's what's really being left out of the conversation at this point. So I really want to take a look at this part of this website because people have commented and you'll see here, if I can click back on it, you'll see here there are 42 comments 
and I want to just share some of what women were saying here. This person says, and look, this is, you know, this is the most latest one is at the top. So this is this month. Endometriosis and cyst removal surgical procedure in 1998 and DNC procedure in 2016, now suffering from fibroids with what kind of medical issues did you have? Here is the thing that hasn't been talked about a lot. What happens if you don't have medical insurance and you've got these medical issues? You've had them in the past and maybe you incurred expenses or you have them now and you don't have health insurance. What are you supposed to do? This person says, I have endometriosis, cancer, bad periods, irregular periods, been trying to have a child for two years now and still haven't gotten pregnant. This is a nightmare. Again, a different a different kind of issue related to this whole thing. The, you know, the difficulty in getting pregnant because of some of these other issues. I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed with endometriosis. I have painful periods. I have had surgery a year ago and now using Myrna IUD to see if that will take the pain away. If this doesn't work, I'll be having surgery again. I have used a lot of hair relaxers. Okay, so this person has already had surgery once and now this person is looking at having surgery twice, a second time. I uh, would not have thought about that one. This person says, I had fibroids and had to endure painful annual exams, extremely long periods, like I wouldn't stop bleeding. It's amazing to find that my problem was linked to something we used to aid us in employment to support our family because we had to look a certain way to be employed. All right, I am going to stop and talk about that one for a second because that was something that was brought up in the complaint when it was filed. There was this whole history about how black women were you know, made to feel like they could not wear their hair in its natural state and that it needed to be straightened and, or pressed so that it would present a more acceptable look if you're trying to start a career and get a job and have employment. You need to have a job so that you can pay your bills and, and be part of the family financial support unit. And if part of what is holding you back is you walking around with an Afro, even a short Afro or hair that's, that's not net, that's, you know, not straightened, then, you know, there was this sort of feeling in the community that you would have a harder time getting employment. So there was this feeling that you had to do this. Now, there are plenty of times when we do things to our hair that we don't have to do. Dying is one of those. I mean, we don't necessarily have to dye our hair to, to get a job. I don't think people are necessarily feeling that until they get older and there's some gray and then they feel like, you know, I'm being discriminated against because I've got more gray hair. People can see that I'm older and I'm not getting as many job offers once I go in there, even though I have the experience and the skills and the training and the education. So there's that part of that. But aside from that, you know, it, it, it just, I don't even know what to say. Let's just go back and see what the next person says. The push uh, to look a certain way so that you can get a job. This person says, I used hair relaxers just for me, olive oil, had hysterectomy from fibroids, developed dark lumps on side of hair and scalp. This person says, I had surgery and used several hair relaxers. I lost a lot of hair. I had a cyst removed from one of my breasts and had cysts and tumors in my uterus, causing me to have a partial hysterectomy with the extractions of both fallopian tubes and an ovary. I had menstrual cycles that lasted three to five weeks. The menses would, the menses would cease for a couple of days and start back because of the heavy blood clotting and flow. Every day I wore newborn baby pampers for sanitary pads. At this time, I still had cysts in my uterus. My navel was also surgically removed during the surgeries. I had DNCs done also to try and stop the bleeding. This is a lot. Um, Three to five weeks is a long time because what can happen is that kind of blood loss can lead you to be very anemic to the point that you might even need a blood transfusion. Then there's this um, other piece too. You know, how are you, how are you even living? What does your quality of life look like if you're having to 
take care of blood flow that's three to five weeks long? Like, what are you able to do? What are you, where are you even able to go? Um, and how does that, how does that impact just your daily living? Uh, this person says, let's see, I was going through testing. I was diagnosed with uterine cancer, crying and hard to believe. Um, lose her hair. My sister, I guess losing hair. My sister asked if I was losing hair, was too afraid to tell her yes. I've been very depressed over this. This was earlier this year. I will be getting more testing in two weeks. Been praying all as well. I have two sons to take care of disabled. I don't know how I'm going to break this down to them waiting until Texas is done. Um, I don't know if she meant taxes or Texas. I'm not sure. Um, okay. So yeah, here, so here's another thing to talk about. Um, over time, when you use relaxers, one thing that people start to notice is their hair starts to thin. It's weaker. It is more likely to break because you are actually breaking the bonds of the hair down. So you are damaging the hair and you have to really take care of it after that point. So you have this weakened hair, increased hair loss. And then one of the other things too, how many people remember getting scalp burns? How many times did, you know, you have a scalp burn on your scalp because of the chemicals and the processing in the perm that burn your scalp? So I haven't seen this one a whole lot yet, but I'm sure there are plenty of women out there who can attest to that one. All right, this person says, been relaxing for about 20 years, had to get a hysterectomy at the time, was using dark and lovely Revlon, Oriel, and TCB devastating results upon using these chemicals. Um, let's see, this person says, my hair was first treated at age 11 with TCB and later on switched to dark and lovely motions and ORS. I was diagnosed with fibroids, January, 2019. The pain and heavy flow was so unbearable. During my cycle, it was hard to walk because I have several fibroids. However, there are several options of surgery. I decided to undergo robotic myomectomy to remove the largest tumor that was pressing against my uterus instead of undergoing a regular myomectomy because I still like to have kids. Currently taking iron supplements due to low iron and heavy bleeding. Currently still experiencing heavy flow because I have fibroids. Another issue. You guys, I can tell you all about these issues because <laughs> I know personally. I can tell you about all of them. Another thing to think about. And I mentioned this from the person who said that they had three to five weeks of um, blood flow. Okay. What did I say? You will experience, you know, decreased ability to do things because you're anemic, because you've lost so much blood. And so at that point, then you're having to take iron supplements. Well, depending upon what kind of iron supplements you take, you can actually have side effects from that too. And so just imagine that you're on this long-term, it's not even a cycle, like iron supplements are now a part of your life because of the anemia that you're going through because of the fibroids that may have been attributed to what you were putting on your head. Okay. This is all of the allegations. So again, another issue here, iron supplements. And I bring this up to sort of say, um, there are all of these different things and, and here, here are my concerns. And maybe I'll come back on camera with this one. Here are my concerns, because there are two concerns here. One is that when this is going to trial, when this is being heard, sure, there's, I think the causation piece is going to be the really big piece here. Did these chemicals in fact cause, you know, each individual to have what is being reported here? Okay, so there's the causation element, that's an issue. What I'm concerned about is that it's just this sort of look at, oh, this person had fibroids, oh, this person had uterine cancer, and that there's not this look at everything else. There's not the anemia. There's not the day after day after day after day of blood loss so that you can't even really live your life, that you're going out and having to buy pampers, that you're going out and having to have iron infusions or blood transfusions, that you're going out and you're having to take iron supplements. So when we get to an individual basis where they're looking at, well, what are we going to take into account to determine whether or not women will get adequate compensation. I'm concerned that it's just going to be limited to these sort of overall themes and that we don't really understand the impact that this has had on women's lives. And so I'm a, I'm a little concerned about the attorneys because <laughs> I don't know them. I haven't looked them up. So maybe I'll do something on them too. But I'm a little concerned about what it looks like when we get to that part. Like, do they really understand 
the women that they're representing and what these women have gone through. I don't know. And so my video is getting kind of long here because I got a lot to say. Um, the second, so that was the first thing. And now I can't remember what the second thing was. So maybe it'll come back to me. All right, let me pop back over here. Oh yeah, y'all are gonna be like, okay, she talked a whole lot in that video. All right, next person. Let's see what this person has to say. I'm a Caucasian female. Okay, so now we get a different experience here because remember I told you in the initial complaint, it was broken down in terms of the history around black women and their hair and employment and how they felt pressured to look a certain way. Okay. So that was a, that was a lot that was presented a lot in this uh, litigation in the complaint. She says, I'm a Caucasian female age 55. I started using hair color, hair color products also. So when the FDA is looking at the band, they aren't just talking about relaxers. They're talking about cosmetic products. Okay. So that includes hair dye. I'm a Caucasian female, age 55. I started using hair color at age 14. And on occasion, since my hair is naturally curly, have used such products to chemically straighten my hair up until around the age of 21. Had no idea of the hazards or damage that it would cause. At age six, 26, I was diagnosed with fibroids, urine, uterine tumors, and underwent a partial hysterectomy, removing my uterus and partial ovaries. Was never placed on any kind of hormone therapy. Digressed. Um, depression has been a part of my life for the last 29 years. Thank God my daughter was born just three years before my diagnosis. Um, you know, it, it almost came back to me and then it went away again. All right. So this is the first time we're hearing about um, hair color. And now we're crossing the racial barrier here. We now have it being not just black women, because we know a lot of this was definitely marketed toward black women, but curly hair women curly haired women. Okay. Women who felt the need to want to straighten out some of those curls. All right. So they were also, they also fall into this group. All right. Let me, um, go on to the next page here. All right. Um, I had relaxes about every two to three months since I was a child at the age of 38, I had to have a hysterectomy due to a, two large fibroid tumors. I have no kids Two. I don't even want to tell you how many I had. It was way more than two. Cynthia says, thank you. I've been getting my hair relaxed since I was 12. I'm now 38. I'm starting having, I, start, I first started having heavy periods around 18 with blood clots and heavy bleeding. I was diagnosed with endometriosis in 2016 and I suffer from fibroids and cysts. Had laparoscopy done in 2016, but doctor couldn't remove all of fibroids and endo. My life has been miserable for the last couple of years due to the agonizing pain the endo causes endometriosis and also not being able to have children i wish i had known then that using hair relaxers would be detrimental to my health but something needs to be done because these companies can't get can't get away with this okay so here is exactly this is exactly what they say in the lawsuit that people would not have used these products if you had told them here is what can happen to you now granted we make these choices all the time, okay? Look at the number of people who still drink and drive, even though you tell them not to drink and drive because here's what can happen, okay? So yes, but what you want is informed, informed consent. Like I wanna consent to buy the product because, and use the product because I have the information and you have not withheld it and you have not misrepresented it. Like this person says here, I wish I would have known then that using hair relaxers would be detrimental to my health. Okay. This person says, I started using relaxers when I was 12 years old. Through the years, I've used dark and lovely cream of nature, um, or as olive oil, motions, African pride, and other relaxers. In 1994, I had to have a partial hysterectomy after suffering pain and heavy menstrual cycles from uterine fibroids. About five or six years ago, I decided to go natural. After years of putting relaxers in my hair every six weeks, this went on for about 48 years, 48 years, 48 years. So here's another concern. My concern is you're going to miss the older group of people. Um, some of those people may have already passed. Um, their family members may not know the information in order to submit a claim on behalf of their estate. They may not be in a position to even know about this or respond to this. And so I feel like there's there's a group now because a lot of younger people are, are natural, they're natural hair people. 
So those people are going to be less concerned and informed about it because they're, they're natural hair. Then you've got this group that's being targeted because they're in the midst of knowing what's going on. And maybe they just stopped um, using perms a little while ago. Like they're in this certain, this certain period of years here. And then you have this group. This is the group that I think is going to get left out down here, even where I, I think I'm in this group that to some extent, they only want to go back X number of years. Yeah. Oh, well. This person says, I got my first relaxer on my 12th birthday. I stopped using them in my mid 20s because I kept having bad reactions. My last reaction actually called my hair to fall apart. In 2019, I had a partial hysterectomy due to the fibroids the day after my birthday. How ironic is that? I have used dark and lovely emotions for years. I started having heavy periods with blood clots, going through pads in 20 minute intervals. After sitting, then standing, the blood would run like a faucet. It was determined that I had large uterine fibroids. Surgery was scheduled. I had to go through 10 days of iron infusion prior to the surgery because of the blood loss my iron was very low. Surgeons attempted to remove the fibroids, but had to stop because it was determined there was a large cluster unforeseen. I had to go through another surgery. I had to undergo a full hysterectomy. You know what? <laughs> I, I have to, I you know need to do my own video <laughs> um, talking about this. You know, I had to have iron infusions. Um, and even when I had my daughter, there was a fibroid that was in the way, like she was breached. She couldn't even move because of the size and number of fibroids. So that's a whole nother video. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go down to the next person. I am now 62 years old and started getting perms in the seventies. Okay. So we now know how long she's been getting perms. I have used dark and lovely cream of nature optimum and just for me for years, I started having heavy menses and passing blood clots. I was diagnosed with a fibroid tumor the size of a grapefruit. I had a hysterectomy in 1993 due to them finding cells. I was 32 years old, 32 years old. I began, have, I began using relaxers in 1974. 1983 diagnosed with endometriosis, was told I probably won't have children. 1985, I had a son. 1986, ectopic pregnancy, cut right tube. Had a son in 1994, all C-sections. 2006, emergency surgery for hysterectomy. Large fibroid covered my uterus. 10 days later, I was admitted to ICU with MRSA. An ascent was put in the urethra. I had no idea relaxers caused so much trouble. I've used dark and lovely motions, optimum cream of nature, and so many others since I was 10 or 11. I've suffered for years from extremely heavy periods, which I thought were normal. I ultimately developed fibroids, which required surgery. I had to undergo three DNCs, get a blood transfusion and several iron transfusions, all due to severe menstrual bleeding. I had surgery two years ago. Uh, yeah, so here was one of the things that they mentioned um, in the litigation. This sort of piece around um, why this should all be like one lawsuit, this one multi-district lawsuit. And the reasoning was because they were, because women have a tendency to use different brands over time so so if you've for example if you've been perming your hair relaxing your hair for 30 years in some instances it's likely that women will change up and there might be over the course of that 30 year period three different brands that they used and one of the things they talked about around this litigation was how do you dissect that out and say which one is responsible if you know, if a person used three different brands and, and say all three different brands had this, the ingredients in them that have been linked to causing cancer, it would be very hard to do. So that's why that's another reason why they said we're going to lump all of these together. We're going to to um, look at this across the districts and across the manufacturers across. Well, not well, not necessarily manufacturers, but the, the companies responsible for this. So you see a lot of people saying, I used this brand and this brand and this brand. I'm almost <laughs> tired. This is, uh, yeah, this is a lot. I have used Dark and Lovely for over 35 years. I'm suffering from heavy menses and I believe it has led me to developing uterine fibroids and myomectomy. I have fibroid that has developed since my surgery and infertility issues. All right, let's go to page three, or five pages of this. I am 62 now. My mother first permed my hair in 1972, and I continued until 1998. So that's 26 years. And what remember the example I just gave, talked about 30 years, right? 
I began to bleed. And finally, after almost a year, was I was passing clots. It was horrible when I was finally diagnosed with fibroid tumors. And they said hysterectomy was the only way to stop the bleeding. At 29, they took my uh, uterine something, which, oh, okay. For hysterectomy, I guess, and prevented me from having any more children. Don't know how or where they came from. I've been getting relaxers since childhood until 2016. Had a hysterectomy in 2011 due to a large fibroid tumor. I was 38 with no kids. Um, so, you know, so for people who don't understand what these blood clots are that they're talking about, they can be huge. They can, they, this may sound really gross to some people. Um, they can look fleshy like, it can look kind of fleshy like, and usually bright, bright red because it's covered in blood and very chunky. So just think of chunks of fleshy material that's bright red that is coming out of somebody. Okay. You have to see it to understand. I've been getting relaxers since childhood. Okay, I already said that one. I'm 48 years old. I had my first relaxer when I was about six years old. Wow, that's really young. That's really young. It was it was a just for me perm. Okay, so now that's understandable. So a lot of times um, the perception, okay, was that you could use a kitty perm. You could use a kitty perm um, and that the kitty perms were a little bit safer because they weren't as strong. And so you even had some adults who would use kitty perms in an effort to um, lessen the amount of damage, or maybe they felt like their texture didn't need a whole lot. It just needed a little something. And so there was this perception that a kitty perm, since it was made for kids, was somehow going to be a little bit more okay. And people also thought, well, hey, you know, I want my daughter to look good going to school again. So the pressure to look a certain way didn't just extend to the black woman going into the career or work environment. It also extended to the black little girls and them going to school. Okay. So understand that this was really, um, there was this feeling here. And, and those of you who watch this later can tell me if I'm way wrong on this or way right, but you wanted your kids to look good. You wanted those ponytails, you know, and you were using whatever grease you were using um, and putting those cute little barrettes on the end and making those cute ponytails or the plaits. And you wanted everything to look nice and neat when you sent your little girl off to school. So I had a daughter. We do braids a lot. I did, I, I did plaits a lot. I was a plaits kind of person. I was like, we're just going to do plaits and we're going to keep it going. Uh, let's see. Ah, a lot, a lot, a lot. Let's see. I, I, I think I went through that part or did I not? I am 48 years old. I had my first reaction when I was about six. It was a just for me perm. After that, I continue to use different perms and relaxers. I was diagnosed with fibroids in 2017. And also in 2017, within the same couple of days, I had a hysterectomy. They took everything except for my, I think she is ovaries. I think there is some, um, what do I want to say? Some autocorrect going on. People are typing in and autocorrect is, is incorrectly correcting what they're typing. Um, except for my ovaries. I'm so sad because I wake up sweating. I wake up hot one minute. I'm cold. I got to open a window. I got to turn the heat on. This is a very miserable thing that I'm going through due to trying to stay beautiful and not be my natural self. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to let that one sit there. I used relaxers from 1985 to 2013. Stopped due to hair loss. I had a hysterectomy in 2012 due to a fibroid. So I talked, to, I've been talking about the side issues, right? The side issues, the health insurance, the number of times you, you know, you're out of work for this, the things you got to buy, the iron infusion transfer. Okay. So let's talk about what you got to do once the hair loss starts, you know, then you have women buying wigs, right? Because there is this pressure, there's this pressure to look a certain way. And part of looking a certain way means that you have to have a, a head full of, a head full of healthy looking hair. And if you have now lost your hair, then you feel like you have lost a part of your feminine beauty. And I'm not saying all women feel this way. I'm saying that some women feel this way and that hair and looking a certain way and having certain attributes is what 
increases or decreases or impacts a person's self-esteem. And so now you have used this product, it has weakened your hair, it is it's attributed to hair loss, and now you're trying to find a way to supplement that. And so it's now I gotta go out and buy wigs, or I gotta go out and try creams and things to get my hair to grow back. So another side issue to take into account, and the way to think about that is, but for these chemicals not being on my head, I wouldn't have had to do this, okay? All right, this person says, I was diagnosed with endometriosis after going through so many painful periods from my teens until I had to undergo surgery, complete hysterectomy and appendix removal due to an abscess that my physician said was as big and hard as a softball in September, 1986 at age 29. At that time, I had two laparoscopies and had been on Danacrine to stop my menstruation twice and had been hospitalized seven times. I never thought that using dark and lovely, also other relaxers could cause these problems. My edges also have remained thin. Mm -hmm. I was on Premarin 17 years until taken off due to my cancer link. My mother died one year, one month after my surgery of metastatic breast cancer and Provera 10 years. Okay, so then that's the other piece, right? What kind of medications am I taking to get things back to where I think they need to be, right? Am I having to take estrogen? Yes, all right. I'm currently waiting on a surgery date to have the hysterectomy, 35 and no kids. I had to have a hysterectomy because of fibroids, been using these perms since I was about nine or 10. Like this is it. This, you know, when the judge gets ready to make a decision, this is really what the judge, somebody should be up there reading this to the judge. Like we should be doing a nationwide letter writing campaign, every single person who feels like they have been impacted by this. I have seen, I have done in some of my other videos, I've done in one in particular, um, Elizabeth Holmes, when she was being sentenced, she um, had people write letters to the judge, you know, um, to be lenient with her, her sentencing. And I went through a lot of those letters, you know, and part, part of the consideration on the prosecution side was the damage that had been done to people who had been harmed by her actions. But her letters, of course, were from family members and friends who talked about, you know, how she had tried to do good and those sorts of things, okay? So when we talk about letter writing campaigns, like I said before, this is what I'm concerned is going to get pushed to the wayside, the actual impact that this has had on women's lives. I think women's lives are generally undervalued. The trauma that they go through is undervalued. The feelings that they have are undervalued. And I feel like I have a concern, let's put it that way, that the outcome from this litigation is just going to be the same thing. It is going to, going to be an undervaluing of women's health and their bodies. All right, I guess I'm on a soapbox on this one. Next one, I had my first relaxer at the age of 15. I've been relaxing for 20 years. I've suffered with cysts and fibroids starting at the age of 20 all the way into my 30s with fibroids, endometriosis, and eventually breast cancer at the age of 37. I've had over 20 surgeries in my lifetime starting at the age of 20 when I was diagnosed with cysts and fibroids. I've had a laparotomy, a myomectomy, click on this and eventually a hysterectomy at 35 years old. If I'd only known that these products would have resulted in my health issues, I would have never used them. Right. But for, had I known. Um, yeah. So one thing that I considered was the myomectomy and I was just like, but there's no guarantee there. And I did not want to be put in the position where, okay, I'm getting a myomectomy and I'm coming back two years later for the hysterectomy because that didn't work. So I just went the, the hysterectomy route. I had fibroid tumors, a tumor as big, a tumor as big as a 26 week pregnant woman with 10 plus all around my stomach. I've had, I have had a hysterectomy, went for the partial thinking that I would not go into menopause. So soon, uh, as soon as soon versus waking up in recovery in menopause. Well, that only went on a year. Now here I am miserable in menopause all because of a chemical I put on my hair that did not have health warnings. My edges will not grow back to save my life. 
this is so sad and depressing. You know, there are plenty of times, you know, we lay our edges, we let our edges do whatever. There's this whole thing, you know, you can just go to the beauty supply store and just buy edges, you know, stuff to put on your edges. That's where we are. We, we have a relationship with our edges that I don't think anybody understands. This person says it's sad and depressing. I have very little edges. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, you probably have noticed that already. This person says, had a very bad fibroid, heavy bleeding. Okay, on to page four, my timer went off because I do have something scheduled for, well, I guess I did my timer wrong. It's scheduled for three, not two. This person says, I've been getting perms over 30 years, just had a total hysterectomy February of this year. Two doctors told me I couldn't have any more children and both recommended I get a hysterectomy. I wanted to keep all my parts God designed for me to have. So I refused to hysterectomy and instead had uterine fibroids removed by laser in 2009. My menstrual cycles remained heavy and the fibroids came back. It was only after I did the big chop and stopped relaxing my hair that I noticed abdominal cramping and bleeding improved. I can hardly get through the work that I can hardly get through the work day and have been dealing with anemia. I am still dealing with all the pains of the uterine fibroids now, intermittent spotting, extreme cramping, and additional expenses of running through overnight pads for daytime wear, et cetera, until I can get another surgery to remove these fibroid uterines, fibroid, uterine fibroids. Yes, exactly. Didn't I talk about the quality of life? I can hardly get through the work day. Can hardly get through the work day. Dealing with anemia. Still dealing with the pain of uterine fibroids here, okay? And let's talk, now this person brings up something too. This is another issue too, um, because I think this is how people feel too. There's, there's some people out here who feel this way too. I want to keep the parts that God gave me, you know, like this is a part of my body. I, I should not have to get rid of it because this thing happened, you know, especially if it could have been prevented had I had the information that was out there that was not shared with me. Had I had that information, maybe I, maybe, maybe I would have been able to keep these parts that God gave me. Yeah. Used relaxers from 1986 to 2007. Hey, this person fits like my timeline. Had endometriosis and then I started, I stopped for like a little bit around 2007, 2008. Then I started back up again. I started back with the relaxers again because uh, I like totally didn't know what to do with my hair. Used relaxers from 1986 to 2007, had endometriosis and uterine fibroids, had a partial hysterectomy in 2011 due to uterine fibroids, always used hair relaxers from a little girl. I'm 56 and just stopped breast cancer treatments, diagnosed in 2021, last scan, showed no cancer. Hallelujah um, for you. Glad to hear that. I used hair relaxers for over 10 years. In 2020, I was um, diagnosed with breast cancer, had a lumpectomy and radiation. I also had genetic testing. This is upsetting. I was diagnosed with cervical cancer. I used relaxers from the age of eight through 36 or 37. I ultimately had a total hysterectomy at age 38 due to fibroid cysts. In 1984, I suffered from uterine fibroid. I had to have a hysterectomy due to the fibroids. I have been using relaxers since 1966. I think that is the furthest back that I have heard, 1966. 1984. Um, in 1995, I had to stop using relaxers. Okay, so we're talking almost 30 years if there was no break in between that because she said I've been using since 1996 and, and since 1966. In 1995, I had to stop. Okay, and why did she stop? Due to bad hair loss. Okay, I still to this day experience hair loss. Can someone help me? Can someone help me? And I, I know plenty of people who have experienced hair loss and it really does impact your self-confidence sometimes for some people. Wow, I've been using Dark and Lovely for over 30 years and putting it on my daughter's hair, also thinking nothing of it at all. I know it is straightening our hair, but in 2007, I had breast cancer. I had to have them removed. Um, I asked my doctor at the time if it was from smoking. He said, no, didn't really know. He was asking me, did I take hormone pills? Never. I replied, I would hate to think that a product I'd love to use did this to me. I've been using Dark and Lovely since the 90s. This can't be true. Yep, I used to Dark and Lovely too. That was my brand of choice. It, I mean, it did my hair great. 
I was pregnant and had to go to the hospital because I was spotting, found out that my baby was not growing due to a fibroid tumor. I lost the baby and also had to have a hysterectomy due to the fibroid. It was so big, they had to remove my uterus. And then here's the last one. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in March 2019, got a lumpectomy and a genetic test, and it came back negative. A year later, at the end of my 2020, at the end of 2020, my cancer came back and had to end up getting my right breast removed. I've used relaxers all my life. If this was a contributor, I want just, I think this person's trying to say I want justice. The emotional and physical state I'm in is priceless. But if I can stop another woman from buying relaxers and obtaining cancer, then that's what I will do. And then this last person said, I had surgery. Um, so that is a lot. <laughs> If you made it through um, this whole, if you made it through five uh, pages of that, that was a lot. I've been talking this, uh, this is like 45 minutes now. Actually, I think I'm going to do this as a pre recorded live. That way I can um, sit in on the comments if there are any comments and just run it that way and maybe do it later on today. But um, this is a lot. And like I said before, I wish I really could think of the other thing in my head that I had going on that I wanted to share. But like I said before, I'm really concerned um, that after the causation piece is there. And let me backtrack for a second, because this causation piece is big. Like you, you can't just say, yes, some studies have shown that there's a, a, a triple increase if you use this product that you will have these things happen to you. That doesn't necessarily mean that for every single person who had these things happen to them, that it was caused by this product. So you see the issue that we're running into. The causation piece is big here. If we lose on the causation piece, then, you know, we lose everything. OK, so if you lose on the causation piece, you lose everything. I just want you to keep that in mind. So that's that's a big part of this. The second thing is, and this is what I keep talking about, this sort of undervaluation of women and what they have gone through here. And I'm afraid, I'm so afraid that this is going to come down to a numbers kind of thing. And it's, well, if you got cancer, then you get this amount, you know, and let's, let's assume we go a settlement route here. Okay. If you got cancer, then you get, you get this amount. If you have fibroids, then you get this amount. If you had hair loss and viral, you know, that there's that there's sort of going to be this tearing effect and it's going to be so basic that it does not completely take into account all of these issues that people have shared in this. And so I think, you know, to some extent, and I'm, I'm probably being a little bit more um, proactive <laughs> in terms of what I'm saying, and I don't usually approach litigation like this when I'm talking about and reading through some of the filings, because this is a little bit more personal for me. And so obviously it's coming through um, as I'm sharing the comments here and talking about this particular litigation. But I'm concerned that if women do not step up and take ownership of this, and that if this is left to the legal system, that you will not get the recovery that you should receive. You, you will not get what justice should look like. And, and I want to talk about, I, I just want to give you a quick example here of the Camp Lejeune water case where you had decades of time where the government knew that this contamination had occurred and that people at Camp Lejeune, not just, not just those who were enlisted, okay, and who were in service, but family members and workers too, who may have been exposed to toxins. And yet it has taken decades. We are just getting to the point where those people are now going to be entitled to some sort of recovery decades later. And so if you think that the government, you would think that the government would look out for their own, especially would look out for the military. 
So if you think that um, someone is going to stand up <laughs> for you, my comment to you, and I said this in other videos, nobody will value you like you. <laughs> the only person who is probably going to value you greater than you might be your, your parents, your mom and your dad. But other than that, nobody's going to look out for your interests better than you are. And so even though you have attorneys in place here, I suspect and, and I'm concerned that, you know, unless you give them the information, they can only have what they have. They can only work with what they work with. And if people are not forwarding them the information that they need to make the case that needs to be made, then, you know, you could run into some major issues here. And then the final thing is, you know, in these settlements, most of the time, who gets most of the money? It's the attorneys, okay? It's the attorneys. We know that, okay? They've got expenses and kudos to them for taking some of these cases on because if they don't take them on, then it doesn't go anywhere. And I can go to a number of websites right now and show you where they're talking about this very same litigation. And then they say, well, we're not taking new clients. We're not taking new clients, which is why I'm going to do another video um, with the short form complaint, with the short form complaint. I'm not your attorney. I'm going to share it with you. I'm going to talk about it, but I'm not your attorney. I don't represent anybody in this matter. And so we're going to talk about it and figure out how we go forward with this sort of complaint. This is probably one of the longest videos I have done. I usually break videos up, but I wanted to, to take some time and go through and talk about some of the other side issues. Want to hear directly from people who could be plaintiffs in this and other hair relaxer cases that are out there because there are tons of them that are out there now. Um, but I wanted to give us a chance to hear directly how people's lives have been impacted by the use of this product. And now you have a better understanding. When people talk about products liability, this is the kind of stuff they're talking about. They're talking about harms that have happened to people as a result of them using a product where maybe the manufacturer or the seller or distributor or whoever may have known that there were issues with the product and did not share that, failed to warn, were negligent, and other people got harmed. All right, so that's it. So hopefully um, this provides you with some information, some understanding. <laughs> Go ahead and give the video a thumbs up. Uh, you know, if it was too much, that's, that's on you if you stuck around and you thought it was too much. Give the video a thumbs up, put your comments, in the comment section below let me know what relaxers did you use how long did you use it i mean tell me what your thoughts are about this because i really want to know i really want to know and don't forget to hit the notification bell because i'm actually going to be doing way more videos about this topic breaking a lot of the issues down and you don't want to miss a thing Mwah. peace